All right. So let's finish up talking about E2, and we'll do that by summarizing everything. All right. So let's say I've got this starting material. I've got a leaving group, and I decide to treat this with a strong small non-nucleophilic base. We've got a few things we need to consider. First thing is the location of our beta protons. We know the alpha positions here. We've got beta position here and here. So we've got some beta protons coming off this position. And we also have another beta proton coming off this position. So if I treat this with a strong nucleophilic base, how many products do you think I will get out? Show me with your fingers. Seeing a lot of twos. Okay, and I agree with that, because if we decide to go after one of these beta protons, regardless of which one we go after, it'll give you the same product, right? So we could form a double bond in that position if we went after one of those. And it doesn't matter which of those protons we went after. Agreed? All right? And then the other beta proton. If we look at that one, we would get a double bond in a different position, right? What's the relationship between these two products? Constitutional isomers, right? So they have the double bond in a completely different position, meaning structurally they're arranged differently in space. All right, now my next question. Which ones are more stable alkene? Second one, okay. So this would be more stable. This would be less stable. Which one's going to be our Zaitsev product? Our more stable one or a less stable one? Okay, so this would be Zaitsev. This would be our Hoffman product. The Hoffman product is always going to be that less stable alkene, meaning less substituted. And then last but not least, which one's major and which one's minor? Do you think the first one's going to be major or the second one's going to be major? Second one. So this would be our major product. And exactly. The fact that this is our major and minor product has primarily to do with the fact that we're dealing with this small base over here. So we do have to take into account the size of the base that we're working with. All right, if we consider doing this again with the exact same starting materials, but this time we use a strong, whoops, let me keep the colors the same. bulky base, this time we would still get the same two products in our mixture, and the same thing would be true, this would still be less stable, and it would be our Hoffman product, this would still be more stable and it'd be our Zaitsev product. But the difference is, in this situation, this would be our major product, and this would be our minor product. Again, this is completely correlated to the size of the base that we're using. Does that make sense? All right. So that's really important to remember with E2 reactions, is which product will be major and mi minor. The other thing that's important to remember is under certain circumstances, we may need to do Newman projections to actually predict whether or not we'll get the E or the Z isomer. Why didn't I have to worry about E or Z isomers for these two? Because we can't identify either of these as E or Z. So anytime you're making an alkene where you could identify it as E or Z, you may want to double check with the Newman projection to see if you're drawing the correct one. Do you remember how to do that? Let's go back really quick and review. So in that case, if you're making an E or Z product, what you may need to do is something like we did here, 
where we did a Newman projection, twisted it until we found an anticoplanar beta proton, and then circled the groups on each side to determine which product we were going to get out. So you may have to do that. All right, a couple other things. What's the rate for these reactions? What do you think? It's going to be second order. We'd have our rate constant, and then we would have our base. So the concentration of the base matters, and then the concentration of our substrate also matters. So just like with SN1, SN2, we can do these rate experiments to determine if it's truly an E2 reaction versus an E1 reaction, right? Because in an E1 reaction, does the concentration of the base matter at all? No. So if we change the concentration of the base and the rate changes, we know it must be an E2 reaction mechanism. All right, the last thing I wanted to go over, and I'll move this up later, This is talked about in your book. The rate is faster for E2 reactions if you are making a more substituted alkene. You don't have to copy this all down in general, as long as you remember this side note that the rate's faster with more substituted alkene, you'll be okay. But let's take a look at why this is the case. And in fact, if you watch the um, video, the supplemental video, this was actually pulled from that video. So in the top reaction, we're going after one of the beta protons on the left, and on the bottom one, we're going after one of the beta, or sorry, on the top one, we're going after the one on the right, and on the bottom one, we're going after beta protons on the left. If you look at the transition state for the top one, you see how we're making and breaking a bunch of bonds in that process, and I've highlighted them as yellow. So during this process, we're ripping off the beta proton. We're adding the pi bond in between the two carbons in the middle, and then we're kicking off that bromine. So all of that's in transition right now. And if we think about forming that new double bond, that's going to be stabilized by all three of those methyl groups circled in green. So in this case, it's going to have a lower activation energy, and therefore this is actually going to occur at a slightly faster rate due to that stabilized transition state. In the bottom one, if we look at the same transition state, you see how we only have one carbon group coming off? So that isopropyl group that I've circled in green, this is the only group attached to the carbons that are going to be forming the double bond. Therefore, it's only got one sp3 hybridized carbon hanging off of it. It's not going to provide as much stabilization from hyperconjugation. Therefore, it's going to have a higher activation uh, energy. So if we think about the top pathway versus the bottom pathway, which one should be faster? The top one. We're forming a more substituted alkene. Therefore, it has a lower transition state energy. So that's something they briefly talk about in the book. But like I said, if you just remember this side note that the rate is faster for E2 reactions, if you're making a more substituted alkene, you'll be completely fine with this. Does that make sense? All right. So I know E2 chemistry is tricky. I've got um, an in-class activity that we can work on later, but I did want to make sure we finish with E1 chemistry before we move on. So let's really quickly look at the in-class activity. All right. So this in-class activity... If we have time, this is in the second edition. This is Skill Builder 8.7. In the third edition, this is Skill Builder 7.5. So depending on which edition you have, you can knock out these Skill Builders, and hopefully we'll have time at the end of class to start working through some of these. All right, last but not least, we've got to cover E1 chemistry. Luckily, E1 chemistry is a lot easier, in my opinion, than E2 chemistry, but there's a lot of things we have to be aware of. All right, the first thing in an E1 reaction is just like with SN1, we must have a good leaving group.
Why is this important in an E1 reaction? It's rate limiting, right? So the rate limiting step is going to be this leaving group falling off. And then the second thing to pay attention to, it is, it is best if carbocation is relatively stable. All right, what's the best stability a carbocation can have? Okay, so resonance is better than tertiary, which is better than secondary, and that's way, way, way better than primary, to the point where primary carbocations just generally aren't even formed at all. What else do we need to watch out for? What can happen if we form a secondary carbocation? Yeah, watch out for rearrangements. Okay, so at this point, our leaving group has fallen off, meaning it has a negative charge. And we typically have some sort of base floating around. And in this case, this base must be a weak base. Why can't we use a strong base with E1 chemistry? What would happen? It would be E2, right? A strong base will absolutely favor E2 regardless of whether or not that carbon is primary, secondary, or tertiary. In fact, it actually likes to do E2 chemistry with highly substituted carbons because we end up with highly substituted alkenes, which we know are more stable. All right, so in this next step, We've got these beta protons, which we said are the protons that are adjacent to our carbocation. So we can say this base can grab any one of these. Doesn't need to be anti-coplanar anymore. And then we'll clamp down and get our double bond. The nice thing with this is that the more substituted alkene is always favored. All right, and then I'm going to put a little side note up here. We must use a weak base or else E2 will occur. All right, so it's a pretty important reaction pathway. However, the one tricky part with this that we'll see tomorrow is oftentimes it's in competition with SN1 chemistry because weak bases are also weak nucleophiles for the most part. So we have to watch out for that. All right, so let's make a list of notes. First is we must have a good leaving group. We must form a stable carbocation. That may rearrange. And we only need a weak base. And the reason we need a weak base is a strong base favors E2. Always. And then E1 always favors the more substituted alkene, which is called the what? Is it Zeitzef or Hoffman? It always favors the Zeitzef. Slash more substituted alkene.
and then SN1 slash E1 mixes are common. All right, there are some tricks to favor E1 chemistry though. Yep. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, in this first part, we said we must have a good leaving group. What if we have a bad leaving group like our alcohol? How can we turn an alcohol into a better leaving group? We can protonate it. That's one method. What's the other method? Tosylate it. So just like we saw in our substitution chapter, we can either protonate or tosylate an alcohol to turn it into a better leaving group. That's a great question. All right. So next part is what if we want E1 over SN1? Is there anything we can do to favor E1 over SN1? Does anybody have an idea? Not bulkiness, because SN1, the size didn't really matter either. How, how could we favor substitution, or sorry, elimination over substitution just generically? Heat, right? High temp favors substitution, or sorry, elimination, not substitution. The other one is start with an alcohol. Then treat with a strong acid. Under high temp. This might look familiar to some of you. So for example, in lab, this kind of gets back to Awesome's point. We didn't have a very good leaving group on cyclohexanol, right? We had alcohol. So what did we do? We treated it with a strong acid. I'm just going to show this as H+. This is catalytic acid. By doing that, we're going to protonate our alcohol. That means that it's going to be a really good leaving group. It's going to fall off, give us a carbocation. And then what's acting as our base in this reaction? It's going to be water, right? So let's even draw this out just for practice again. During this step, we now have a good leaving group. So what we can do next is kick this off. We'll get a secondary carbocation. Will it rearrange? No, it will not because there's nothing better that it can rearrange into. So next step, we've got water, our weak base, that will react with our carbocation to give us our alkene, and then we'll regenerate our acid. But in this case, the water is going to be a really weak, or weak base However, isn't water also a weak nucleophile? Yeah, I would say water is a weak nucleophile. So why doesn't it do SN1 chemistry? Or does it? Yeah, it could do SN1 chemistry, but what happens if we do SN1 chemistry? We're basically reforming our starting material, right? So it's just in this point, kind of up here, we're kind of stuck in this equilibrium. So in fact, you can often see this shown as equilibrium arrows. However, we're able to drive this out of equilibrium by heating it. And then what in lab did we do to actually purify this and remove it from equilibrium? We distilled it, right? So during the distillation process, we were actually able to pull this out of equilibrium and then use Le Chatelier's principle to push the equilibrium to completion, which is kind of cool. So by using distillation, we drive this reaction to completion.
So that's a good example of using Le Chatelier's principle. So either one of these situations can be used to favor E1 over SN1. Um, the second bullet point, starting with an alcohol, eventually will exclusively favor E1, which is a kind of nice reaction pathway. The top one, you still get an SN1, E1 mix just simply by doing heat. Um, however, you tend to get more E1 than SN1. Make sense? All right, let's do some practice. All right, so I'm going to give you a problem. I'm going to give you catalytic acid, and then I'm going to show this triangle down here. That's the delta symbol. What does that mean? That just means heat. So if you see that delta symbol in your textbook, that just implies that there's a large amount of heat added on. So what I'll do is I'll give you a few minutes to work on this. But I want you to give me all of the potential products that could result from this reaction. And then check with your neighbor to see if you're on the right track. All right, so I'm going to try something. I'm going to pretend like I'm an organic chemistry student working on this, and I want you to correct me if I'm making any mistakes. All right, so as an organic chemistry student, I'm going to say, all right, there's an alcohol, catalytic acid, heat. This is going to be E1 chemistry. All right, E1 chemistry, I know my leaving group falls off first. So there I go. I'm going to kick off my leaving group. Is that okay? What's wrong? It's a bad leaving group. Oh, shoot, I forgot. All right, how do I make this into a better leaving group? Protonate it. All right, so at this point, you've caught one of my mistakes, which is good. Now we've got a better leaving group, so okay, now I'm going to kick it off. Okay, so in this step, I can now kick off my leaving group. And I'm going to say, all right, over here, I've got a beta proton, and I've got water floating around. So is it okay for me to just grab this proton and clamp down? Rearrangement? Oh, shoot, I forgot about rearrangement. You're right. <laughs> you as well. So up here, we got a secondary carbocation. However, we can move this hydrogen over. And by doing that, we create a more stable tertiary carbocation. So thanks for helping me with that one. <laughs> All right, so now at this point, is there any other rearrangement we can do to make this better? No. However, I will say during exams, students oftentimes, they're just so focused and in the zone, they completely skip the rearrangement step. So assume that if you form a carbocation that you need to be looking for potential rearrangement alternatives. All right, so now I would go ahead and I would say, all right, I've got some beta protons right here. Do I have any others? Yeah, I've got two coming off of here. All right, so what I'll do is I'll just pick one of these. Does it matter which one I pick? Nope, doesn't matter. All right, so if I do that, let's take a look at the product we'll get out. So that would be one potential product. 
So I'll circle this in a red box saying this came from the red arrow pushing. What about if I go after this one and clamp down? Oh, yeah, I'm forgetting a carbon here. Thank you. So let's try that one. So if I do that one using the blue arrow pushing, it would look like this. So I'll block this up in blue. Are those different, the same? How are they related? They're the same. So I could draw it twice. I could draw it three times. I could draw it four times. I could draw it a million times, but it doesn't make it more right. So in this case, I'll just draw it once and say both of those arrow pushing schemes give me the exact same product. So I'll only show that one way. All right, let's do the other one though. So the other one we said, let's maybe grab one of these protons. All right, in this situation, we would get a double bond right there, clamp that down, and now I'll put this in my blue box. So we've got the red arrow pushing pathway and the blue arrow pushing pathway. Did I make any mistakes? I don't think so. How are these related to one another? constitutional isomers. Okay, so we know that these are constitutional isomers. We also know that we're going to regenerate our acid during this process. So this is going to be, let me actually do a different color. The acid is regenerated. All right, which one's going to be my major product? The first one, why? Because it's more substituted, it's more stable. So this would be my major product. This one over here would be my minor product. So make sure that you do go through slowly with these because like I said people often forget to protonate their alcohol they kick it off first or they forget about their rearrangement all right want to try a harder one this one's going to be more about the mechanism and in fact I pulled this from the textbook So that's our starting material. And then after heating this with catalytic acid, things kind of change. All right, so let's propose a mechanism to explain what the heck is going on here. But trust your instincts. What do you think the first step will be? Protonate the alcohol. Then what do you think the second step might be? Uh, then the leaving group will fall off. And then after that, we would have a carbocation. And then what, we, what might we need to look out for? Rearrangement. And then could we even have step-by-step step step rearrangements? Meaning one rearrangement followed by a second rearrangement? Yeah, as long as we're progressively getting to things that are more stable, rearrangements are always allowed, right? So keep that in mind as you're working through this mechanism. All right, it seems like people are getting pretty close on this one. So let's take a look. So just like before, common mistake I see students make is they say, all right, let's kick off our leaving group. Can't do that. It's not a good leaving group. So first step is going to be kicking off, or sorry, protonating our alcohol. So make sure that you show all of these intermediates. So now I've got a protonated alcohol, oxygen has a positive charge, can't forget that. And then next step, 
now that it's a good leaving group, that alcohol can fall off. Hopefully everybody got at least this far. All right, so at this step, I've got a secondary carbocation. Is there any way to make this better? Rearrangement. What sort of rearrangement can I do? A methyl shift, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of these methyl groups right here, and I'm just gonna slide it all the way over. It means over here we now have a tertiary carbocation. All right, tertiary carbocations, pretty good. What's better than tertiary though? Resonance. resonance. Is there any way to get a resonance stabilized carbocation? Yeah. In fact, we've got this hydrogen over here. Let's see what happens when we slide this hydrogen over via 1 2 hydride shift. The methyl groups are still going to stay put, but now our positive charge is going to be moved over here. So this is tertiary carbocation with resonance. We know that that's more stable. All right, so let's take a look at our final product. Do you think we're gonna do our elimination at this point or what else do you think we need to do? Yeah, let's draw the resonance structure. I think that's a good idea. Okay, so what we can do is draw the resonance structure, kick that pi bond over. That means that our positive charge would be here. And we need to remember double-headed arrows and brackets there. All right, so now we're getting pretty close. Looking at our final product, this ring and this ring match now. So we've made progress, we've gotten that far. All right, what I'm noticing though is we're missing our double bond right there. So what do we need to do? Yeah, we need to remove one of those beta protons to form our double bond. All right, so knowing that we've got these beta protons right here and we've got water floating around as our weak base, water can reach over, grab one of these beta protons, clamp down and get us to our final product. So a lot of these are just basic elementary arrow pushing. They look really overwhelming at first, but the more you do it and the more you kind of spot these hints of like, hey, I've got a carbocation, can it rearrange? Um, the more you can um, process going from point A all the way to point B. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, I think I know what you're asking. The question is, why don't we deprotonate this beta proton and then get a double bond here? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually a great question. We haven't covered this. In fact, they don't really talk about it much in our book. But typically, uh, endocyclic double bonds, meaning double bonds within rings, are more stable than double bonds on the exterior of rings. So double bonds prefer to be incorporated into ring systems. Um, so that's why our final answer, you see how both double bonds are in rings versus down here, this would give a double bond outside of the ring. That's just not as favorable. Great question. All right, so what we're going to do with the remaining time is try to do some of the in-class E2 practice. This is just a portion of your skill builders. This is a really important problem set. Um, please don't skip this or put it off. Try to get it done before the quiz. This is excellent review. What I'll do is I'll even post a key in OneNote so that you can check your work um, or you can check the study guide in the book if you'd like to.